Are you recording? Yeah, sure. All right, y'all, let's get into it. So, like I said before we went to break, we are going to look at Illustrator some tips and tricks. Now, what's in our uh, canvas shell for this week is the, um, it basically walks you through the steps again of how to set up your diamond shape for your actual signs. And we're gonna go through a little of, of that right now, but we're gonna talk about other things in Illustrator that could be helpful for you in terms of adding a little bit more flair to what you're making, right? So I'm gonna go through right now and I'm gonna just do my process of setting up a new file the way that I've shown you before. I went to uh, the print tab so that all of these things will populate the way that I want them to. I'm gonna change it to inches. I'm just gonna leave it at eight and a half by 11. Uh, I'm gonna up my artboards to three because that's how many different signs you need to make. So it'll be helpful for this demonstration. And I'm gonna name it ahead of time. Just name it Lala underscore signs okay cool all right so i'm gonna leave all of this the same i'm not gonna add a bleed i'm not gonna change the color mode or the resolution and i'll just hit create to get my document and it's thinking okay cool there you go well, so hmm? oh, sorry. what kind of color were we supposed to add again cmk or CM cmyk okay. yeah Cool. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'll just make this artboard my main one. Uh, again, to do that, I clicked on one of the artboards and then I did the keyboard shortcut of Command Zero, which will take the artboard that is active and snap it to be full in my screen, right? Cool, cool, cool. All right, so I'm going to go through quickly. I know some of you are still uh, setting up Illustrator. I'm going to go through it quickly and then we can run through it again. I want to give you a basic understanding of what, like just what's possible. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start with my rectangle tool so that I can set up my sign. Um, I'm also looking at my tools here. They're all my basic tools. So actually, before I get started, I'm going to come over to window. And then I'm gonna come down to toolbar and I'm gonna change it to advanced. And then I'm also gonna go up to window and I'm gonna come down to control and I'm gonna click that. So that I have my control bar visible to me and then I have all of my full tool set visible to me. These computers likely reset to basic every day when they get uh, turned on and turned off. It's not the most convenient thing, but it's what happens with the lab computers. All right, so now my rectangle tool is selected. I'm gonna come over and I'm just gonna click on my canvas so that I get the dialog box to make my rectangle a specific size. So again, I selected my rectangle tool and then I just came over here and just clicked and released my mouse, All right? So for starters, I'm just gonna type in six by six, six inches by six inches, because that's the size I want my sign to be. If you're trying to type in six by six and one second, I might just change this to something random. Cool. If you're trying to type in six by six, but every time you type in one number, the other number changes and you can't understand why, it's likely because of this. This thing is linked. So this means that these two boxes are changing in proportion to each other. So I'm gonna go ahead and uncheck that. This says six, and now I can just type in six here and I'll hit okay. So it's made my initial box for me. I'm gonna come over to my uh, selection tool, not my direct selection tool, but my selection tool, because I need to move this over a little bit. So I'm gonna grab it and move it over to where I want it to be. And now I'm going to rotate it. So I'll come over here and I'm in my selection tool. And when I hover near any of my corners, I'm going to get that curved double-sided arrow. So here's my curved double-sided arrow. And I'm going to hold down my shift key so that I can rotate it proportionately. So what that means is that if I try to just rotate it, oops, if I just try to rotate it, there's no way, like I could look at the angle 
uh, degree in the little gray box next to my cursor there. Uh, and right now it's perfectly rotated to 315 degrees, which is what we're looking for. But if you want it to be foolproof, you hold down your shift key and it's only going to rotate in 45 degree angles. So you don't have to worry about like, did you rotate it the perfect amount or not, right? So 315 is what we're looking for. Now I can release my mouse and release my shift key, right? I'm gonna turn the lights down right quick to make sure you guys can see. All right, perfect, there we go. Make that a little bit better. So now we have our triangular shape here. And it's the shape that we're looking for, but we need to double check our dimensions. And there's a couple of different places where you can do that. Here, the transform button. Now there's something I haven't mentioned to you in past classes when we talked about our control panel at the top. I want you to notice that some of the names have a dotted line underneath it, right? The names that have a dotted line underneath it, what that means is that this specific control has an entire panel that it's associated with. So if I come over to window and I come down to my T section, there's an entire transform panel. Here it is. I opened it. This entire transform panel, I'm going to dock it, this guy is the same thing that's available here, right? We have most of the options, but some of them aren't fully visible. But if you look, we have this guy, we have our X and Y axis, we have our width and height. So anytime you see something that is underlined like this, like shape, like stroke, like opacity, it means that it has its own panel associated with it. And when you click it, it's going to open a basic version of that panel, right? So we're gonna come back over here to transform and you can change it here with our width and height or you can change it in your transform panel with your width and height. But we want this number to be six by six. Right now it's currently 8.4, 853 by the same number and we want it to be six by six now in this case because both of these numbers are the same you can make your life a little bit easier by linking them together click your chain link here and then when you change one to six because the numbers are the same it will change the other one to six as well right the only time this is inconvenient is if you want these numbers to be the same number you want to change it to something that's the same number but they're different in the like from the get out so then that's when having this clicked is not convenient but if the numbers are the cha are the same then having it clicked makes it easier right do you guys have questions about that now some of you folks were still setting up i'm going to walk through this one more time because i want to really make sure that you fully get it and i'm going to do it a little bit slower right so we have our document set up we have our three artboards ready to go if i zoom out we can see all three of my artboards and as i've mentioned to you before i am a fan of keyboard shortcuts so i'm going to click on one of my canvases and then i'm going to use the keyboard shortcut of command zero if you're on a pc or using a pc outside of this classroom because all of our computers in here are max uh it would be control zero instead of command right so I'm going to come over again to my rectangle tool, make it active. I'm going to come over to my artboard and I'm just going to click and release my mouse to get this dialog box. Right now it says 6-6 six, six because that is what I put in the last time I used it. So that's the only reason why it says this because these are the measurements I put in the very last time I used this tool, right? So I hit okay and it'll give me my box. I'm going to go to my selection tool and then I'm going to move it onto the canvas. And if I hover over any of my corners, any of these guys, 
I'm gonna get my rotate tool. So my selection tool will automatically become my rotate tool. I'm sorry that that monitor over there is still out, guys. It makes it a little harder for you folks on this side in the back. It, yeah, sorry about that. So I'm gonna click it. I'm holding my shift key. I'm gonna rotate it 45 degree angles. Remember when you're holding down your shift key, it's going to rotate automatically in 45 degrees in 45 degree increments, right? So there's my sign. I'm gonna go ahead and transform the size. I'm gonna use this one this time. My numbers are exactly the same in width and height. So I'm gonna leave this checked off. And then I'm gonna hit six. And now we have our sign that is six by six. Now let's show you some fun stuff. So there's a really cool panel that is super helpful that lets you play around with the appearance of the things that you make. Now, a lot of these panels will allow you to do that, but the one that we're specifically looking for is our appearance panel. So I'm gonna come over to window and I'm gonna go to my A's and find appearance and then I'm gonna open this guy up. So here's my appearance panel and I'm gonna take it and I'm just gonna dock it to make my life easier, right? So here it is, here's my appearance panel. It doesn't need to be this big, so I'm gonna just like, can I, are you gonna let me? Uh, it's not letting me scale it down, so this is fine. So I'll leave it like it is. Normally, I'm not sure why it's not doing it right now, but it gives you a double arrow, like this one right here, along the bottom so that you can scale it up. But for some reason, it's not letting me do that. So that's fine, we'll leave it like this. Now the appearance panel is pretty special. It lets you do some pretty cool things to your individual shapes in an easy way. And I'm gonna go through and show you some of those things. So right now, what it's telling us, like what this is communicating, is that my shape has a stroke on it that is one point. And then it also has a fill color that is white, right? So I'm gonna start by changing my fill color. To do that, I click on this guy, I double click on it to open this up. So right now, this is my swatches panel. And there's like other options here, but for now, we're just gonna stick with the swatches panel. We're gonna pick a color that's close to what we're looking for, and then I'm gonna edit it. So I'm gonna pick this yellow, and then I'm gonna double click on this, on this swatch here. And it's gonna open up my color options or my swatch options so that I can make changes to this guy. So it's yellow, but it's a little more yellow than I want it to be. So I just wanna add a little orange or a little magenta to make it look a little bit more orange. So we're gonna talk about this in a moment and you'll, and you'll see this if you haven't already gone through the color lecture, but CMYK, the color mode that we're in, it stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And the reason why this is what you wanna use for print design, we've talked about this a little bit in the past, the difference between using CMYK for print design and RGB, RGB for anything that's meant to live on a screen is that these four colors are literally the four colors that are inside of that color printer in the back of the room and inside of every color printer. There's a cartridge of cyan, one of magenta, one of yellow, and one of black. And that printer is smart enough to take the right amount of each of these colors as designated by your file to mix any color in the spectrum, right? So we're gonna make an adjustment to our magenta right now to make this a little bit more orange. I'm gonna hit preview so we could see it happening live. That's too much. I'm gonna take it down. I think about right there is good and I'm gonna hit okay. All right, so we changed our fill color. We have our original stroke here. I'm gonna go ahead and also make this stroke a little bit bigger. I'll make it at like four points, right? So the point of the appearance panel that I'm trying to get across right now is that it lets you control the appearance of your object. But it's really powerful and you can do cool stuff. Like we can come here with this eyeball and I can tell it turn off my fill color. 
it didn't remove it it didn't take it away it just turned off its visibility i could do the same thing with my stroke tell it to turn off the stroke color again it didn't erase it it didn't like change the color over here if we look it didn't change take the color away and change it to the box with the red line over it that means there's no color inside it just temporarily disabled it another cool thing that you can do here is you can add additional fill colors and you can add additional stroke colors to one object. And this is what I wanted to show you. So I'm gonna come down here at the bottom of my panel and there's a few different options here. If I hit this trash can, it's going to delete the thing that's selected. So right now my stroke is selected, so it would delete that. Um, I can add in things. So if I do that, it went ahead and duplicated the thing that was selected, which is my stroke. I'm gonna undo that for now. I can come over here as well. And when you hover, it says add new stroke. So I can click this and it's also going to add a new stroke as well, right? And inside of here are the effects, but we'll get back to this in a moment. So I just added a new stroke to my shape here and the one we want to work on we'll leave this original one intact we're going to select this one to make this one active and it doesn't really look like anything's different right it looks exactly the same and unless i make major changes to the stroke width you're not really going to see the difference yet right but there are two strokes and we know that there are because they're listed here in this in this panel so the, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come down to effects and there's all kinds of different options here. Things that you could do to your shape, to the thing that's selected in this case, to the second stroke. The one that we are looking for right now is path. And there's a couple of different options in here, but the one that we're focusing on right now is offset path. So when I select this, I get this box and notice that it already changed my stroke a bit, right? So it's offset this stroke, this second one that we have here, and it's made it a little bit larger. So it's made it 1 .1, or 0.1389 larger. So it's outside of the dimensions of the shape. If I were to change this and put a negative in front of it and hit tab, now it's offset it the same amount but in the opposite direction so no matter what number i put here i can change this to a quarter i can change this to three it's going to offset that stroke however much i add in whatever that number may be right so i ideally i want it to be offset just a little bit from my outer stroke I'm going to change this number to an eighth of an inch, which is uh, one, two, five. Mm, I want it to be a little bit bigger than that. So I'm going to change this. Let's try one, seven, five. Perfect. Mm, a little bit more. Let's try one, nine. Right. Okay, perfect. So now my, now my object has two strokes to it, an inner one and an outer one. And before like trying to make something like this happen without the appearance panel, you would have had to go in, make a second shape, align that second shape with the first one, size it down to where you want it to be. And in order to have this appearance, so you would be working with two shapes as opposed to just one, which complicates things a good bit. If we were to come back to our layers panel and look at it, we are still only working with one singular shape here. That's all we have, right? So go back to our appearance panel. All right. Cool. Wait, ready to go. Here we go. I want you bigger. There we go. All right. So the next thing I want to do is I want to play around with the size of these strokes. I'm going to go ahead and make my inner stroke bigger. Oh, make sure my object is selected. I'm going to make my inner stroke bigger. I'll make it like six points. And then I'm going to make my outer stroke smaller. I'll make it like half of that at three points right 
okay i'm kind of digging what that looks like but now i'm like i don't really want my corners to be hard edged like this so we talked about this before there's these little icons these little circles in each corner and you can use those to manipulate your shape i can take it all the way down to a complete circle even though that's not what we're aiming for but you can manipulate your corners as much as you want to fulfill the design aesthetic that you're going for and notice that it doesn't just manipulate the outer stroke it also manipulates the inner stroke as well so I'm gonna stop it at about right here. Go for it. I missed how you got that tool open at all. I have the lines and everything, but mm -hmm. how did you get the curving? The curving? Yeah. So right now I'm just in my selection tool. You also can get to this with your direct selection tool. So either one will bring up these circles and they're already naturally a part of any shape that you make in Illustrator. So all you have to do is click on one of those circles and hold and then pull in and then it'll manipulate your shape right cool so you can use this to add as many strokes or like fill colors or whatever that you want and a part of what makes this cool is that it allows you to change the appearance of a singular shape without having to use other shapes to do so, right? Like maybe you're like, oh, I what I really want mine to look like is I'm gonna add another stroke. I'm gonna put it in between these two strokes. And this guy, oh, so inside of all of these, there's whatever extra things that have happened to it. So for this one, we have an opacity on it. And this one, we have an opacity set to default. This one has been offset. So this is our offset path, right, by 1.9. So I'm gonna go ahead and offset it even more. I'm gonna offset it by, just for uh, poops and giggles, I will we'll offset it by a quarter of an inch. Oops, there we go. I will offset it by a quarter of an inch. My shape wasn't selected. Remember in Illustrator, it always has to be selected in order to have an effect. And then, so I'll close this up. What did I do with you? Where'd you go? Did I put you inside of someone? Huh. I made another stroke, but I don't know where she went. Okay, I'll just make another one. There we go. Now, this one, I'm also going to go ahead and offset it as well. So I'm going to come in to my effects path, and then I'm going to offset this one. I'm going to, ooh, well, no, that's way big. <laughs> Negative, so it comes in a bit. And I'm going to leave it at that. But I'm going to take the stroke down way small so that it's like a much thinner line. I wanna offset it a little bit less. So I'm gonna maybe take this down to one and see uh, a little bit more than one. I'll take it up to one, 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 two. Okay, that's good. And so then I'm gonna make it, so now this one is half the size of what this one is. And I'm gonna make my original one. I'm gonna change the order. There we go. And now I'm gonna make the original one, which is this guy, a little bit smaller. So I organized it so everything is in order. So this is my outside stroke, this is my middle stroke, and this is my inside stroke. So you can add as many strokes as you want or as you need, depending on what your idea is. And there's all kinds of different effects in here. Um, they may not necessarily be appropriate to like the project that we're working on, but like playing around with some of these things and like what they do. Like I have the innermost one selected and you could, I'm gonna change it to normal. And you could add like a drop shadow or this one is an inner glow. I don't want an inner glow, cancel. Let's do a drop shadow instead. So I'm gonna come in here, I'll go down to stylize and let's add a drop shadow. 
So here it's adding a drop shadow to this thing. This is, I am a, like deeply disgusted by drop shadows in most instances, unless you have a really good reason for using them. But I'm just showing, I'm just walking you through and showing you the different possibilities. You can offset it in different directions. You can make it more blurry, less blurry. Uh, to create kind of like a dimensional effect depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you can change the opacity on it. You can change the way that it's blending with your object. We haven't talked about blending modes, but and I don't think we really need to get into that in this class, but it's a really cool feature that all right, so I want to say, I'm going to repeat myself. I know I just said this, but I want to repeat it for the video. Uh, I want to say some of the few important key points about color and a few important key points about modularity and grid systems. Um, and, and then we'll look at your thumbnails. Uh, we'll spend as much time with that as we can. Um, so with color, the one thing I, one thing I really want you to understand is that color in and of itself is an entire design entity. It is a powerhouse that can do so much for your individual designs. And with color, the same way that you need to make conscious choices about um, the types of lines you want to work with, the type of graphic imagery you're trying to create, you need to also be making really conscious choices around color too. Meaning that you don't want to sit there and be like, oh, like, I'm going to pick hot pink because I like hot pink. Well, does hot pink work well for what you're trying to communicate, the message? Does it work well for the overall goal of the project? Like you have to think about the color in relation to what you're trying to accomplish. And like, suppose you're selecting multiple colors. You have to think about, do these colors work together for what I'm trying to accomplish? Is there enough contrast? Are they complementary colors, which, ironically, aren't complementary. <laughs> when you put two complementary colors next to each other, they actually like almost hate each other and want to get away from each other. Like if you butt them right up next to each other, examples of complementary colors like red and green, you butt those right up to the edge, that line is going to do a tricky thing to your eyes. Like it's going to be almost hard to look at, like the colors vibrate against each other. So it's like these types of things that you really need to take into consideration when it comes down to color choices. With City of Olala, I took all choice away because I want you to focus on design. I told you the colors that you can work with. You still have options. You have three colors that you can work with, which are the yellow, and I didn't give you a specific one but I told you a range to stay inside of white and black and you decide how to work with those within your sign I didn't give you any other color like red for instance which is actually a sign you could a color you could see on a street sign and it's because red can communicate so much information and I want you to communicate what you're trying to say without the aid of a color Red can tell you to stop, it can say caution, it can say danger, it can say all kinds of things. And I want you with this project to communicate caution, danger, stop with the design choices that you're making. So it was a conscious choice to eliminate and not give that color as an option. But for our next project, it's all a free for all every color anything you can pick whatever you want and you have to think about the way that those colors are working with each other if they're working with each other right the and like this i also want to say that this information right now is not a don't look at the lecture information look at the lecture information if you have not okay and the other part of it is about modularity and grid and the grid is an interesting thing what it does is it helps you establish structure on your blank page. So if you're looking at your like blank canvas and you're tr and this like applies to every phase, even within your thumbnails, if you're looking at your blank page and you're like, I need to create a layout, where do I start? The grid can help you organize your page in a certain way and then help you figure out like how to start working with your elements, where to place them. Some people hate the grid because they say that it creates like designs that look rigid. 
I, on the other hand, think the grid is amazing because it gives you parameters to work with. And once you have parameters, it makes it a lot easier to start making decisions. Sometimes when you're looking at a white page, it's hard to like really decode where to start. But those parameters can be really helpful with guiding you through that part of the process, right? The grid can exist in so many different ways. There's grids that are just straight vertical lines. And there's in the lecture, it talks about the different types of grids. There's like manuscript, which is just the whole open page. There's two columns, which is literally what it sounds like two columns, three, four, however many columns you want. There's modular grids, which is the page being broken into different size modules or boxes. And the power of the grid is that it can really help you understand your negative space better so that you can work with it well, right? A lot of people have heard of the grid. For me, I, I learned about the grid when I was in undergrad, but it wasn't until post-grad school that I really was able to wrap my mind around how to use the grid a lot of people have heard of it but have no idea how to really use it like how to put it into like form and function i think my instructors probably didn't know how to really use the grid so they just told us about it but they didn't like actually show us how to use it and like the different parts of the grid like the lines could be used for alignment to play around with Say you're like, I have like 10 elements and I want to place them according, like center point aligned with different lines within my composition to like create like whatever you're trying to accomplish. Say you're trying to create a like a minimalistic design and but you want to be really intentional about where you are placing the elements that you're working with. Using a modular grid could be great for that because it's divided into these individual cells and you can pick a cell and work with that one and like make a little composition within that individual cell and have all of this white space. Like there's a lot of possibility for what can happen with the grid, but like folks look at it and they're like, oh, everything is just gonna be like straight lines and placed in these specific places. But the grid can be circles, like every logo out in the world, um, the Apple logo, like all of these different logos have grids applied to them. Like if I come over into Google right now and I search Apple logo grid, this is the grid of the Apple logo, right? And all of the different apps in the App Store, there is a specific formula that Apple requires that their logos conform to in order to be in their App Store so that there's consistency. So there's, and that's one of the big things about the grid is it helps to establish consistency within design. If we come over and I do, Not maker. So if I come over and I do Olympic logo grid, so this is like for this one, like it breaks down like the main Olympic logo and the grids that apply to it. But within the like individual sports, like each of these guys are, this isn't real, let me see. <laughs> Let me see images. Each of the individual like sport icons, for example, are designed using the same grid so that all of the lines are like all of the diagonal lines are following the same angle. The angle of this arm is the same angle as this arm. The angle of this is the same reverse angle of this, same angle as this. And across the board with all of the different uh, logos being created, all the different icons for the Olympics being created using that same grid, it's going to make it where every single one, no matter what they're representing, is going to have really strong consistency, right? So the grid is a really powerful tool and like learning how to use it really well takes time, but it is really a friend to you. Learning how to use it well is like a, a really good gift to give yourself. Um, there's a few really good books on it. There's one just called The Grid, and it's a really good book around like the theory of the grid. 
um, like the design theory of the grid and how it works and like helps you wrap your mind around it. It's what like I read post school and I was like, oh, I totally get it now. <laughs> I understand what this means, right? Yeah, any questions about this? These are the main things I wanted to touch on, right? Oh, there was one more thing I wanted to say about color. So the last thing I wanna say about color, I mentioned it in the lecture that we were, like in the um, illustrator information we went to, there's two color modes. I have four fingers up, I don't know why. There's two color modes. And those color modes, two main color modes that we wanna focus on, and it's RGB and it's CMYK. And they do very different things. Within design, you have to be conscious of the color mode you're working in. And they're also kind of a thorn in our side and I will explain that as well. So RGB, as I already mentioned, relates to digital spaces. So if you're designing graphics for an app or a website, um, for like a digital banner or billboard, like things that are going to exist digitally and it's never going to make its way through a printer, then you wanna focus on RGB for those colors. Every single monitor in this room, this camera I'm recording with, your cell phone, Every single, color, every single color that you see on that screen, it's made with light. It's made with red, green, and blue light. That's what the RGB is. And they, co they combine together in the right amounts to create every color across the spectrum, right? So even looking at this right now, all of this that we see, this, this, even this color, it's red, green, and blue light combining together in perfect amounts to make those colors. Now, if you were to make something for print and, and you use an RGB color space, this is the problem. Inside of that printer, as I mentioned a moment ago when we were going through Illustrator, there's a print cartridge. And the most basic color printer is going to have a single cartridge in it and it's going to have cyan, magenta, yellow, and black in that cartridge, right? No red, no blue, and no green. So if you send a file that you've created in RGB and you try to send it through a printer that only has CMYK, then that printer is going to have to try to make it up. It's going to have to try to decide, like, how do I make this color that the formula came through to me as RGB, how do I make an approximation of this using what's available to me, the colors that are inside of me, the CMYK? right? And it is not going to get it perfectly right. Those colors are not going to match up perfectly. So you're going to end up with color shifts that you did not intend, right? So with anything that's meant to go to print, you need to use the color space CMYK because that is what's in the printer. Simplest, just those four really high-end printers. I have a printer at home that has like CMYK, but it has light it has like light magenta and light cyan and light yellow so it can get an even like larger range of colors because it has those extra little like pieces in that equation right so that's the main difference between cmyk and rgb rgb is made from light and cmyk is made from pigment right there are two different types of colors called subtractive and additive colors right and they're made two different color systems of colors made in two totally different ways right anything else i want to say about that i think that's it anything else out here questions cool all right so that uh, illustrator offers um it basically changes the way an object on top is interacting with the objects below it but that's, we don't need to get too in depth with that, right? So there's all of these different things, like different effects that you can add in using the appearance panel. Um, yeah, there's like a lot of different possibilities. And if there's something you added and you're like, ah, I don't really know how I feel about this weird drop shadow that I added, you can just come and temporarily turn it off, turn off the visibility on it. And you're like, okay, like, I like it better without, I think, I'm not sure, and you can keep working. Or if you're like, yeah, I really don't like this, you could select that specific thing and just hit delete. Or if you're like, you know, I added this stroke and I'm really not a fan of it, you can grab the whole thing and drag it and drop it into the trash can, right? 
So overall, this panel gives you a lot of possibilities for how to experiment with things and play around with things. Do you have any questions about the appearance panel? Right? Now, another thing that I want to say, well, actually a couple more things I want to say. So I'm going to zoom out right quick. With these signs, it is a really good idea uh, that you don't repeat yourself, meaning that like you don't waste your time making one sign, doing all of this effort, and then you go make another one and do all that effort, like just to make your background sign. So what I suggest in terms of like workflow and simplifying your process is once you make your sign in a way that works for you and like you like you like how it's set up it's like working really well for what you were looking for like you're a fan of it once you get it like where you want it to be and you're like okay this is the base for my sign i like it what I recommend you do is just copy and paste this to your other artboards. So there's a couple of different ways you can do that. I'm gonna tell you my favorite way to do it is I select the object that I wanna copy and then I just hold down the Alt key and move it. When you hold down the Alt key and you move an object it's going to automatically make a copy. Now you have to make sure that you let go of your mouse before you let go of your Alt key because if you don't, this is what's going to happen, right? It's just going to move your original piece without making a copy. So you want to make sure that you hold down your Alt key, you move your object, release your mouse first, and then release your Alt key. And then you do the same thing. I'm holding down my Alt key, I'm moving this guy to my other artboard, and then releasing my mouse, releasing my Alt key, right? So last time we talked about Illustrator, we talked about our workflow and making sure that you're setting yourself up in a way where everything is as organized as possible. Let's go ahead and look at my layers panel. So right now I have one layer and my three rectangles. If I were making signs like you guys are going to be doing and I went into this, I would have like and I left it like this and I made all of my things. It would be an unorganized mess. It wouldn't be clear what sign, what piece of thing that I made went to which sign because it would just organize itself the way that Illustrator does one on top of the other on top of the other unless you change that setting but we're not going to talk about that I just want you to know it is possible to change that setting but we're not going to talk about that because that's more advanced than what we need right now right so it's going to make it the way illustrator makes things stacking it one on top of each other on top of each other so like i told you with the pen tool boot camp you want to organize yourself i'm going to go ahead and make two more layers and like whatever your the name of your signs are like just name them i'm not going to try to be creative right now i'm just going to say sign one i'm going to name this one sign Two. And remember, there's two ways to change this information. You can double click on the word or you can double click on the open gray space and you're going to get this pop up and you can change it here to sign three. OK, right. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to come and put one of these rectangles inside of each one of these guys. And I can even turn off the other ones. So I'm focusing on whichever one I want to at one time, right? So this one's active. Now I'm focusing on making this one. The other signs are invisible. There's no distractions. And this is also, you want to make sure that, e that you're on the right layer when you're making things. So say you're here and you're like, all right, I'm going to start drawing my object. And then you come over and you're like, oh, huh, why does my pencil look like this? Anytime you see that symbol in Illustrator, it means that you can't draw and it won't let you right? So you want to always try to be cognizant of what layer you're on, make sure you're on the correct layer, and then you start drawing. And then everything that belongs to sign three is going to go on sign three layer, right? Now you have your thumbnails for this project, and we're going to look at them in a second and make sure that you guys can get some feedback on that. And, um, 
Okay, the be I lost my train of thought for a second. The, the best method is once you have your design solidified, you're like, this is my sign, this is the one I wanna work with, then scan it and take it into Illustrator. The same way that you did with Pen Tool Bootcamp, where you took those images I provided you, you put them into Illustrator, and then you started working on top of them. Do that with your thumbnails. You don't have to sit there and try to eyeball what you made. It's gonna make it infinitely harder on yourself, right? So take that image like take a nice flat photo of it there's a couple of different apps that are free that you can use there's like genius scan and some other things and using those scanner apps are really helpful because what they do is you can take the picture and be a little askew like be a little off and that those apps will make sure that it's perfectly oriented flat within the settings so that you know your image is perfectly oriented correctly right um i believe with the adobe capture app you can do the same thing so adobe has apps as well that i believe will let you uh capture your work and bring it into the software right do you guys have any questions? We're clear? You guys understand how to manipulate this? This stuff is pretty simple. I think the hardest thing we've talked about so far is like the pen tool, but all of these little like nooks and cranny type tools that you can work with are all pretty, pretty simple. And there's a lot of possibilities inside of the appearance panel with the effects that you could play around with. There's like 3D tools and options. There's um, ways that you can distort, your, distort the thing that you've created so like if i come over and select one of these guys like there's all of these types of things free distort where i can like come in and like distort it let me see if it lets me yeah so there's like all of these different things that you can like play around with and they all have their uh their different effects uh so on and so forth i'm gonna delete that because i don't want that there <laughs> right <laughs> cool all right so i'm gonna go ahead and turn the video off